When we recall an event from our past, like we're telling a story to someone about a birthday party we went to a long time ago or your first high school dance, as you're telling that story and you're accessing that memory, what does it feel like? You know, is it like you're watching a video where every second from that whole memory plays out from start to finish? Probably not. You know, it's probably a series of snapshots, moments that you remember very vividly, but there are gaps between those snapshots. See, the way our brain stores memories is similar to the way a computer stores digital recordings. It doesn't record every single millisecond of a sound wave. It takes snapshots. And then when the track is played, those dots are connected and the computer retraces the original sound wave and that's played through your speakers. So just like that, our memories are a collection of important moments. A lot of times in memory studies, they'll have someone read a story. And when they go back and have them recall that story a day later, a week later, a month later, they get the important plot points, but the little details between differ from person to person. They retrace what they think is most likely to have happened between those snapshots they remember. This is why stories and memories can change and drift over time. Each time we relive that memory, we're not recounting the exact event that occurred. We're reliving our brain's best guess of what probably happened between specific moments that it stored. So a lot of what we know about memory comes from this woman, Elizabeth Loftus. She spent her entire career studying how real memories are stored and how false memories hijack the system to plant themselves in our brain. She's conducted a bunch of studies in which she planted false memories in subjects that were so successful and so convincing the subjects could not tell the difference between that false memory and an actual real memory. She was so good at this that a lot of the subjects refused to believe her when the study ended and she told them that was a false memory. They would fight her. They go, no, 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 I was there. So how did she do it? Because memories are just a collection of snapshots, a lot of the time to recall a memory, false or real, you just need that first data point to get the ball rolling. This is why it's hard to think of song lyrics from the middle of the song, like the second verse. But if you hear the very first line of that song, it all comes flooding back and you can sing the entire thing start to finish. If you can just get that first data point, the rest of it comes pouring in. So when it comes to false memories, you don't have to plant the whole thing. A lot of the time you can just plant a little seed, one initial data point in that brain to get that memory started. Go plant that seed, man. A lot of the time people will just build the rest of the memory themselves around the initial starting point. In one study, she had subjects sit down and watch a video of like a car driving by a camera. One question that she asked was, was there a broken headlight? Now, one group was asked the question very directly. Was there a broken headlight? Did you see a broken headlight? A lot of the time that group said no, because there was no broken headlight. But the other group she asked with slightly more suggestive language. She said, did you see the broken headlight? This is a small change, right? But it, it implies that the correct answer is yes. Now there was a broken headlight. This group was significantly more likely to say, oh yeah, yeah, I saw a broken headlight. And then they would tell her all about it. So this is a false memory, a subtle one about a very mundane detail that she plants just by suggesting it may have happened. Another example of this is a study that was kind of similar. She had subjects sit down, watch another video, but this time it was of car crashes. And she asked the subjects how fast the car was going. Now, one group, she would say, how fast was the car going when it crashed into the other car? The other group, it would be, how fast was it going when it collided? Or how fast was it going when it bumped the other car? The estimates that each group gave her were significantly different. So when she asked a group how fast the car was going when it smashed into or collided with the other car, those groups gave significantly higher estimates than people who were asked how fast was it going when it bumped into or contacted the other car. Now these might seem like very small differences, kind of inconsequential details, but once you get your foot in the door with this tiny little seed of a false memory, what you've done is you've separated the person from reality. And that initial break leaves a lot of room, a little gap where you can start filling in additional falsehoods.
It's hard to plant a false memory about being abducted by squid-like aliens and flying to Mars and having a picnic. So it's uh, Dave? Usually false memories when they're planted are very similar to actual real memories that exist in that person's brain already. Maybe it's a memory that occurs at work or at school, a place that you go to every day. It's not hard to picture yourself there. So you might ask someone, hey, you know, do you remember the time, not a time, do you remember the time Brian showed up late to work? And it's not that hard to picture, first of all, Brian at work, walking through the door, whoever Brian is. It's not that hard to picture yourself at work. And it's the initial starting point of a false memory that can then be built off of in incremental steps. So what Elizabeth Loftus would do next is she would fill in details, but she wouldn't force feed them details. She would just sit back and let them paint the rest of the picture. She'd ask questions about very minor kind of inconsequential things like this guy, Brian, walking into work late. It follows logically that he was wearing clothes, most likely. And so if you ask him what color was his shirt, they're going to force themselves to come up with an answer. So in this situation, they'll probably imagine, picture a blue shirt. And they'll tell themselves, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that being blue. Very similar experience. And so they then report, oh, he was wearing a blue shirt. But was it short sleeved or long sleeve? Was there music playing over the radio when he walked in? And if so, you know, what was the song? And what's happening is they're filling out little tiny details and making that memory more realistic, more lived in. And it's driving the roots of that memory deeper into the person's brain. Operant conditioning comes from behaviorism. It's a theory of learning. So animal trainers talk about this a lot. They'll mention reinforcements and punishments. If you ask a dog to sit and it sits, it does what you ask them to, then you reinforce the dog. You pet him, tell him good boy, give him a bone. And those same principles can be applied to humans. That's what speeding tickets are. They're punishments for an undesirable behavior. It's also what a paycheck is. It's a reward for a desirable behavior. So as this person is recounting the memory, if the interviewer reinforces them every time they add a new detail to their story. So if you ask them, you know, what color was the shirt? And they go, oh, it was green. Go, oh, good, good. You remember. Wow, you got a great memory. Those little reinforcements are going to make that behavior more likely to occur in the future. Over time, you're shaping this larger complex behavior, which is the recollection or the creation of a false memory that never occurred. The reason Loftus was conducting this research wasn't to manipulate people. It was largely applied to legal settings. There have been several situations where false eyewitness testimony, details that were misremembered or filled in that were kind of fuzzy, have actually convinced juries to convict innocent people and put them in jail. When researchers have looked back at law enforcement interviews with eyewitnesses that have led to false testimony and false imprisonments and convictions, they find that a lot of the techniques the officers use are the ones I've talked about in this exact video. This has led to increased skepticism in the way that courts interpret eyewitness testimony and led to an increased need for convictions to be backed by other forms of evidence as well. Your existence, who you are, is largely rooted in the past. Right? In this moment, when you view to describe yourself, you would mostly talk about things that are probably not in the room with you. Your job, your friends, your family, your childhood, things you love, your favorite movie, your favorite types of music. Much of the most important things in our lives in any given moment exist only in our memories. Loftus's research showed that it is so easy to create these false memories that oftentimes it happens by accident, spontaneously. And if these memories are inherently unreliable and they are the bedrock and foundation of our identity and our relationships and the things that we feel as humans, it has some very unsettling larger almost existential implications for the validity of the human experience in general.